Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to It's Rainmaking Time. This is Kim Greenhouse. I have an interesting piece of information for you today. It's been many, many years where I had this feeling that there was this upper echelon of market makers, of masters, of people that were potentially manipulating markets, industries, interfering, exploiting financial markets, sabotaging them, that would bypass good faith human efforts. And I heard about a book called The Quants, How a New Breed of Math Whizzes Conquered Wall Street and Nearly Destroyed It by Scott Patterson, a staff reporter at the Wall Street Journal. And I had to call Scott over to its rainmaking time to explain the essence of this book and what we need to know about high-frequency trading and who these quants are. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Scott Patterson to its rainmaking time. Good morning. Hi. Thanks for having me. I want to know what led you to write this book and to research this subject. Uh, uh, in the summer of 2007, there was this extremely unusual event. Uh, a lot of these quant hedge funds that uh, operate beneath the surface of the market, most people never know what they're doing or have never even heard of these, uh, these funds, suddenly had a, uh, a huge blow-up. It came out of nowhere, and uh, I, some of my sources on Wall Street started telling me about a few of these people, and uh, one in particular caught my caught my attention. It was this uh, very secretive uh, proprietary trading operation at the investment bank Morgan Stanley. These guys are uh, so secretive at Morgan Stanley that I, I started calling around to some of my contacts at Morgan, and they'd never even heard of these guys. So uh, it turned out that they were the largest prop desk at Morgan Stanley. They were running something around 5 to $6 billion for the bank using uh, quantitative mathematical formulas and and computers, and uh, they had just gone through a, a really volatile period. They'd lost about $600 million in the course of a few days. Um, they were run by a guy named Peter Muller, who was just sort of fascinating uh, on, on the face of it from who he is. He's, he's uh, sort of, uh, you know, he, he's a guy who had moved from New York to, New, uh, to California, actually, and kind of uh, turned into a, something of a hippie and a surfer. Um, but he was also really good at math and somehow found himself into this, in this quant world and came back to New York, was working at Morgan Stanley. Um, at one point, he, he got really into music. He started playing his uh, electric piano in the subways of New York City, busking for change, even though he was worth hundreds of millions of dollars. So you had this combination of this very secret group uh, and this sort of charismatic person running it that, to me, just screamed out for a story. And I, I wrote a story. It was a page one story in the journal. And uh, from there, I started, you know, sort of picking away the layers of this quant world and, and learned about a lot of other people and, uh, you know, learned what they were doing. And, it, and I, st- I started realizing that these guys have taken over Wall Street um, in so many ways, and, uh, and, and that's sort of how the book got started. The quantitative models we know from climate change, for example, are a lot of the times wrong. Basically, whatever you put in, that's what you get out. So it very much depends on what you're factoring in. Garbage right. in, garbage out. Right, gigos. <laughs> yeah, so these simulations... They're supposed to be used as tools to look for what-if scenarios, but it's been mm-hmm. turned into the truth in Wall Street, correct? Mm-hmm. Explain right. that. Right. Yeah, I, you know, it's it's a debate that goes on amongst the quants all the time. Is it, you know, was it the models or was it the bad data that went into the models? And um, it's obviously a combination of both. But I think built into a lot of these models are assumptions about the way that the market behaves, and uh, in the book I call that uh, the truth. Um, it's, uh, it's this belief that there is, uh, by using historical patterns and uh, feeding those patterns into models that are, uh, uh, they, they have certain inputs like volatility, for instance. 
um, how volatile the market actually is. That's something that is often just, uh, you know, a, a number that these models are assuming. And, you know, when you look at the history of these models, that uh, the, the volatility numbers are dramatically underestimate uh, how bizarre, how wild, how chaotic the market can be. And I think a lot of times that's, that's actually self-serving because if the models actually uh, had inputs saying the, the market could be extremely volatile, you just can't bet as much money. And that's what it comes down to is the ability, the models are, uh, are tweaked in order to maximize potential profits. Um, but that is uh, laying the groundwork for a huge blow up. Wouldn't you say the quantitative models are revealing the fact that the human factor as the essence, as the core of it, has been taken out of the equation? Mm-hmm. And that represents the X factor, therefore. Right. Correct? Yes, I, I, you know that's that's one of the big problems. Is you know they're they're using uh, quantitative formulas that are assume, assuming that human beings are going to act rationally. Um, it's a uh, it's a huge theory that it's dominated uh, the way that these guys work. It comes out of the universities. It's called rational expectations. Um, it's also a key component of the efficient market hypothesis. The, the idea that the market is going to behave itself and, uh, and act in a way that is predictable. And if you don't believe that, uh, you can't use math and, and models to, uh, you, to make giant bets on the market. And the reality is, and I know that, to, I mean, to me, I was really shocked when I learned that this is what these people think. But Because when you know, a normal pe- person thinks about the stock market, you think greed and, and fear and panics and bubbles and, you know, all sorts of stuff that aren't rational at all. And, uh, you know, that, that's, I think, what happened, especially in, in August of 2007 when a lot of these quant hedge funds started melting down. They, you know, their models were actually operating in reverse. The exact opposite of what they were predicting was happening. So uh, they, you know, it was definitely an eye-opening experience for a lot of these people. I think it's fascinating that the human factor in all of this has been taken out of the central equation of quantitative models. Mm-hmm. For example, when Steve Jobs got ill a couple of years ago, Apple stock dropped like a hundred points. Mm-hmm. When that word got out, that's how reflexive quote the market and humans are. They mm-hmm. thought that the main leader was going to be gone and the company would not be worth as much. So people fled the stock. Okay. And I think if you look at that as a microcosm, after reading your book, when you see the high-frequency trades that are going on, and you say they're between three and four milliseconds a transaction, is that true? It, it's actually faster than that. <laughs> you know, I, uh, I've learned more about high-frequency Trading since uh, since I wrote the book and have written fairly extensively about it for the Wall Street Journal and these guys are actually measuring trades now in uh, uh, by something called a picosecond, which is a one trillionth of a second. So it's no longer a millionth of a second; it's a trillionth of a second. Right. <laughs> How can uh, that not yeah. alter markets, Scott? Well, How can I, that I, not alter and impact industries? It, it does. Uh, you know, I mean, it's a big debate going on right now. Um, why, why do these funds need to be doing this? Why do they need to be sending so many orders to the markets? And the, the exchanges like uh, NASDAQ and others like this uh, because they get, they get to charge a small fee for every order that they take. So they're actually encouraging this behavior and some, you know, people think that there's, there's a lot of risk being built up. Um, the, the high frequency firms doing this claim that there is no risk and that, uh, you know, they, they're on top of everything and, and, you know, they would be the first ones to lose out if anything went wrong. So they're very careful 